What's up? Um, so today I'm just going to talk about the respiratory system. Uh, mainly I'm going to focus on the um, sagittal view of the face and the upper neck to focus on the, the nose, the nasopharynx, larynx, basically how air travels in through your nose, back through your nasopharynx, uh, pharynx, and then larynx and uh, trachea to bronchus and lungs. I'm just going to describe that pathway visually, um, that way it's easy for you, uh, you to follow. And I'm going to describe uh, the major, I guess, the anatomical features and why they're there. Okay, so just a quick overview. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I have a basic outline of the face. I'm going to go over it with a red marker. So that way you can see what I'm talking about. So basically you've had the nose out here and this outer opening is called the nares or the nares. Um, the air, as it comes in, the first thing, one of the first things it, it encounters is uh, what's known as the concha or the conchi, uh, plural. Um, there, uh, there's actually three, superior, middle, and inferior. They're also called the turbinates. Okay? And basically, they're these bony structures uh, with a pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelium that uh, have plenty of valve cells and ciliated um, and cilia that help move the, um, the mucus and uh, trap debris. Okay, and so basically, the, uh, when you look at it on a sagittal view, they're sticking out at you. But when you connect both halves of your head together, they actually create these tiny, uh, tiny tunnels for air to run through. Okay, basically, what it's doing is it's restricting the area that air has to move within the nasal cavity. So you have the superior, middle, and inferior turbinate, and air is going to be divided between these three. And it's going to uh, reduce the diameter uh, that the air has uh, space to travel in. Basically, what it's doing is when you keep a constant flow, you reduce diameter, you increase the velocity. And once you increase the velocity, that leads to an increase in the Reynolds number, and therefore you increase turbulence. Okay? And the reason you want to increase turbulence here is because what you want to do is you're trying to uh, trap the debris, trying to trap the bacteria that are coming in from an external environment. Uh, out here as opposed to it going all the way through and to your lungs where it can cause uh, major damage. Okay, so that's why you want to create turbulence and as you create turbulence, the um, particles and uh, bacteria get trapped in the, uh, in the epithelial layer, the mucosal layer actually, and that way it doesn't have to go all the way through. Okay, uh, so as the air is coming through, it passes the conchi. Um, actually, one of the first structures before that uh, up here um, on top of your eyes, there's this cap, um, uh, uh, basically a cavity here that's formed, but it's actually filled with uh, air and other uh, um, other uh, physiological structures, and basically it's a sinus. Okay, so you have a few sinuses, and this sinus right here is the frontal sinus. Okay, so I'm just call it F. Uh, once the air passes through, back here there's another sinus, and that is called the sphenoid sinus. I'm going to call that the uh, just the S for now. Um, so anyway, as the air is traveling in through, it is warmed and moistened by these structures, okay? Um, and as the air comes through, there's this uh, opening right here, and does anyone know what that is? That is actually the eustachian tube, okay? I'm just going to call it E for now. Basically, this is how the middle ear connects with the nasal pharynx. Uh, to maintain proper pressure within the middle ear, okay? That's why, you, that's how you can uh, uh, maintain appropriate conductive hearing. Uh, I'll go over this in later videos, I guess, but uh, basically this is so that the uh, ear can maintain the pressure necessary to conduct the, uh, conduct vibration properly, okay? So the air passes in, okay, and this first area right here is known as the nasal pharynx. Okay, that's just the name of it. This whole general area from here all the way down to this structure, which is known as the larynx or the voice box, is called the pharynx. Okay, so this whole structure from there to there is known as the pharynx, and the pharynx is divided into three areas. That's the nasal pharynx, right here where your mouth is, right behind your mouth, is known as the oral pharynx. And then right next to the uh, larynx is known as the laryngeal pharynx. Okay, and that's basically the area where food and air share, basically. Okay, so you have air coming in; it's going to go through the pharynx and through the lung, uh, through the um, uh, the the larynx, the trachea, excuse me. And 
of course, when you have food as well, it travels into uh, through the pharynx, but uh, most of the time for us, hopefully, it doesn't go through the, uh, the trachea into the lungs, but rather it goes through this structure right here, which is the esophagus. Okay, I'm going to go over it in red just to make it stand out. So, uh, air is coming in, it's going to pass these structures, and it's going to go in to, uh, through the structure of the larynx. This right here is a trachea. Okay, and just to be clear, uh, these structures out here is the outside of the nose, and you have the uh, lip, although it looks kind of weird. Um, you have the, the teeth, the upper teeth, and the lower, and this structure right here is actually your tongue that's retracted. Uh, that's your tongue uh, muscle, um, and here you have the upper part uh, of your mouth, the soft palate right here. And this part that sticks out, as you know, it's very important. Um, it is actually the epiglottis. And this is what prevents um, food when you're swallowing to, uh, instead of going into the, uh, the trachea, it helps it goes, uh, go to the esophagus, okay? So here is the separation between the trachea and the esophagus. The esophagus is behind the trachea. And the way I remember it is that you need air to breathe first before you need to eat. Uh, if you try and suffocate someone, they'll die much quicker than starving them. So air first and then food. So you have the trachea in front and then the esophagus behind it. Okay? And so you have, let's just say you have food coming in. I'll go, I'll go over this later, but if you have food coming in, the, the epiglottis basically just flops over the um, trachea and it prevents uh, the food from going into the trachea, okay? Um, so, moving back to the, uh, to the air, the uh, pathway of the air. So the air is coming in from the outside and it is being warmed, the breeze being filtered out through the turbinates, okay? And the sinuses, let's see, there we go, okay. And then it's, it's going to say it's going to join in together right here. And the main reason it's going in to the, the trachea, not the esophagus, is why? It's mainly because the lungs, I'm just going to pretend that these are the lungs right here. They're not. Obviously, the, you need the, you know, the, bron the bronchioles and you need the bronchus and the alveoli and all that good stuff. But I'm just going to call these the lungs. But when, what happens is when you breathe in, when you inhale, the lungs expand and of course you create that negative pressure and that's what's driving the air in so that's why the air chooses to go through this pathway, the trachea, instead of the esophagus, okay? Uh, and basically there is no epiglottis or anything like that so that the air doesn't uh, go into your esophagus and sometimes it does and that's how you end up with those awkward uh, burps when you're eating food, uh, when food actually, you know, you have air that goes in and mixed in with the food. Uh, but anyway, that's how the air gets in and goes through your lungs. Okay, now I'm just going to go over the major points of a couple of things that I thought were important. Uh, obviously, I, I mentioned about the uh, superior, middle, and inferior turbinates, or the conchi, as they're called, um, the pharynx, and the trachea is the third thing I'm going to go over. Basically, just um, a few uh, histological things and just uh, anatomical. So I'm just going to erase this real quick and talk about what those are. You know, actually, instead of erasing them, I'm just going to keep it on. That way, you, get, you can have a visual of everything. Uh, but I'm just going to talk about it real quick. Uh, so t the turbinates I've already mentioned. They had the pseudostratified uh, ciliated epithelium. Therefore, it could trap all the debris and the bacteria. They also had the goblet cells creating the mucus. Um, also, they create that turbulence to trap those things better. Um, Second thing I wanted to talk about was the pharynx, and the pharynx was this general region right here. It's behind the the mouth and the nasal cavity, and the pharynx is, the, um, as I mentioned, the common area for food and air. Uh, it's uh, divided into those three, and the main type of cells that you find in the pharynx is the um, stratified uh, squamous stratified epithelium. Okay, it's a stratified squamous epithelium. And mainly it's because when the food comes in, um, it, it, it contacts these areas and you want them to be resistant to the abrasion of outside molecules coming in. Uh, so basically, that's how you want to think of it. Whenever you want, uh, whenever you think of like uh, the respiratory path, uh, you want to think of pseudostratified ciliated epithelium. Uh, just, 
you know, just so it can uh, maintain the movement of the cilia, it can maintain the correct movement of uh, the mucus, thereby transporting the mucus out instead of moving it in. So you want to have a pseudostratified ciliate, ciliated epithelium that has these goblet cells that are continuously secreting the mucus and uh, keeping the bacteria and other particles outside of the body. Now, obviously, when it comes to the uh, digestive tract, you want to have that stratified ciliated epithelium to prevent the abrasion. As when you have it stratified into multiple layers, um, you know, even if the first layer goes off with the food, you have multiple layers behind it, it's much more resistant to abrasion as opposed to the pseudostratified one. Okay, um, and then finally, I just wanted to go over the trachea, and the main thing to remember with the trachea is obviously it has those cartil uh, cartilaginous rings, and the main reason it has those rings is so that it can prevent uh, being, uh, so that it doesn't just collapse on itself. Okay, so whenever you create that negative pressure, constant air sucking in, uh, you don't want it to be just a flimsy little uh, rubber tube so that when air is sucking in, it just sort of collapses. So you want to have that cartilaginous ring to keep it open when that happens. Okay, and that's why you see those cartilaginous rings in the histological sections. Obviously, they're made of hyaline cartilage as opposed to some of the other structures um, which uh, are made out of, uh, you know, elastic cartilage. Um, so, let's see, the trachea, okay, and that's all I wanted to mention there. And finally, I'm going to go over how the epiglottis works, just giving a, a brief um, a picture, a visual of how that works. I'm going to draw this all over again. Okay, it's very simple. So if I draw the nose and you have the mouth, okay, I know that looks very bad, but okay, that looks horrible. That looks horrible. All right. Have the mouth, okay, nose, back. Basically, the air comes in. Here you have you have your tongue that's over here and all the good stuff in your mouth, but. You have the larynx that's first, and then it goes in to form the trachea and the bronchus, and right behind it, it just sort of connects like so. It makes like an upside down U, and here you have your esophagus behind it, and then you have connective tissue. Uh, so basically, what happens is, uh, if I may redraw just the tongue area. Yeah, it's the first tube and that's the second tube. Okay, and so uh, <clears throat> actually connects in over here, and here's the back of your tongue, and here is the epiglottis. That's it sort of constantly sticks out just a little bit like so. And when you're chewing food, okay, I'm going to draw food in red. Just pretend like you're eating strawberries or giant cherries or some sort. And so you have food, it's coming in. Right now the epiglottis is not blocking, but as soon as you start to swallow, as the tongue moves back, okay, here's the arrow, this is the part where you're chewing, here's the nose, the mouth again, really horrible looking, and okay, so I'm not an art student. And here's your tongue again. And what happens is the epiglottis actually just collapses backwards, like so, here's the larynx again, the esophagus, and basically the epiglottis just collapses over, over the trachea, thereby preventing the food bolus from going into the trachea, but rather goes back through the esophagus into your stomach. So all happens is the epiglottis goes from here and it just uh, sort of uh, contracts and then uh, flops over onto the uh, trachea, okay? And that's pretty much it. And uh, I hope that gave a visualization of how things work in breathing and how that's, uh, how the, how food is prevented from going into the trachea.